Okay, so um, Android is number one. It has, uh, there used to be a lot of different mobile phone operating systems. Now they're all gone. There are only two, Android and iOS. Nothing else even gets close to 1%. They're all dead. Uh, so Android's 80 2% because Android is not controlled, so there are thousands of devices with different versions of Android, and they get down to very cheap devices, which of course is how you flood the market, many cheap devices. Uh, here's the, there used to be a competition among various people, but that's all over. Now it's Android, iOS, and nothing. Nothing else gets up to 1%, so we can just forget about them. Um, so Android itself is open source, based on Linux, uh, quite similar to Ubuntu inside. Um, the Google apps are not open source, so if you want to have Google Maps and Google Play and stuff, you have to install them uh, from hacked versions, the way we're doing in Genymotion, or meet Google's requirements so Google will let you have them and put them on their phone. And that means Google is able to make it so a fully functioning Android, fully functioning Android with the Google services is up to a certain level of quality, that's the idea. And if you're doing stuff like leaving Android Debug Bridge on and running everything as root, then Google won't let you put their, uh, their apps on that phone. But the end result, this is the ridiculous problem, of course. iOS, most everybody has the latest version. I, Android, iPhone users usually jump and buy the latest thing. And they have to force you to put the updates on. Android is pathetic. This version 4 is the most popular version, even though it is five, six years out of date or something. Uh, and less... And I don't think there's ever been any time when they got as much as 1% of the market using the latest version. So people are using stuff that has known vulnerabilities three and four years old. And the patches don't exist, and you can't put them on, unless you put on a modified ROM and then take it over yourself. So this is the Android architecture comes, there's a Linux kernel down here, which enforces the, uh, the accounts when you log in and separates them. Then there's a lot of libraries, like WebKit to draw web pages and SQLite to store data and so on. And then there's this thing called the Android Runtime, which consists of the Davic Virtual Machine, which is just a version of a Java Virtual Machine. And if you, you know you can install Java on a PC, and you can connect it to your browser, and then you can run Java apps in the browser, which are written in Java, and they are um, written in, they're compiled down to bytecode, which is a little bit closer to a machine language than Java, and they run in the virtual machine. And the same thing's true of your Android apps. They're written in Java, and they run in this virtual machine and access Android libraries. Up here, got an application framework, and that's how apps touch the hardware. So up here, you have things like reaching the telephone, uh, reaching Windows, and other things you might want to do, like the networker up here. And at the top, you've got applications, which are visible to the user. So um, it, the Android kernel is not equal to a Linux kernel. It's based on a Linux kernel, and it does not have as many different versions. Uh, every year or two, they decide to have a new Android kernel based on Linux kernels. Um, and there's a chart here to show which ones are used. There's originally 2.6, then this one. You notice there's no 30, no 31, they, they skip some. And then there was various ones based on kernel 3, and the very latest ones have kernel 4. But those are Android kernels derived from the Linux kernels, occasionally. Uh, for most of us, this doesn't really matter, but if you really get into Linux, there's features that come in with later kernels. Maybe there's libraries to do things, uh, graphics, SQLite, WebKit. These libraries are written in C, or C++, and then compiled. Um, the Dalek VM and Core Java libraries are also written in C and C++. These, these libraries and the Dalek VM are called the Android Runtime. That's where your apps actually live, most apps that are written in the Software Development Kit. Most people prefer to use the Software Development Kit, Android Studio now, to make their apps, and the apps you end up with are written in Java and compiled down to Javic byte, uh, Dalvik bytecode. So that's the, then the application framework up here is where you get access to things like the GPS and the network and the file system. And this is where a box will pop up when you install an app saying this app needs to access the network, the telephone, the logs, and so on. So your apps are written in Java. You can write apps in C and C++, but you have to use a different cool kit, the native development kit, which I've never used and most developers don't use because most developers are content to write apps in Java and run them in the Dalek virtual machine. All right, I got a few eye clicker questions. So which component has the Dalvik virtual machine? All right, that's the Android runtime, the environment for apps 
written in Google uh, Android Studio. All right, which component manages processes and memory? All right, that's the kernel. Good, all right. Where is SQLite? All right, and those are libraries, of course. Good. All right, what language are apps made with if you use the Android SDK? All right, and that's good old Java. All right, so we'll talk about the security model. There are two layers of security controls on apps. There's permissions that you grant when you install the app, although this is pretty much a fraud because all you can do is say yes or no, and if you say no, you can't install the app. Now, there are third-party apps you can uh, install in addition to this that will let you have line item veto on some of those permissions. But in practice, this um, step where users say, OK, I allow you things, amounts to nothing more than like that 100-page terms of service that nobody reads and just says yes. Uh, but anyway, in the kernel level, you have uh, the usual kind of permissions. Every app runs with a different user account and, the, and has its own folder to put its private data in, and no other app has permission to read that folder and it's logged in as a different person. That's what's called sandboxing. So the apps can't access resources from other apps, and they can't directly access hardware components, except the ones they got permission to use through this other process. So if you run PS, you'll see that there's root, a lot of apps running as root. Those are the system processes that Google wrote running, in, running Android, but the actual apps are running like this, U0A7, U0A0, U0A77, and so on. Each app has its own user account, and if you look at the directories, each directory has read, write, execute for the user, but only execute for group and others. So each app has sole usage of the um, contents of its private folders, and that's where you're supposed to put things that only one app can see. So if somebody manages to compromise an app because it has a vulnerability, or somebody manages to trick you into installing a malicious app, it should still be sandboxed and not able to steal data from other apps. Unless you find a kernel exploit, and you can elevate to root, and then of course you can do anything. Here's the application framework. When you install the Bank of America, it tells you I have to have access to the camera and the phone and all this stuff and you have to accept it or you can't use the app. But anyway, they take, in some legal sense, you approved this, although in practice, I don't know what else you're supposed to do. Yeah? You have found a tricky part. You can, you can download it, but then after you download it, um, you can turn off, you, you can go back to settings and apps, turn it off. The, in the settings? Yeah, in settings, you can still be able to. <coughs> oh, I didn't know that, even in settings? In settings, yes. Well, the only thing I knew was you can go to install the third-party apps. You can go turn some of these off. That's interesting. Yeah, but uh, like for example, Google, if you turn off the, your location, you have to turn it on. Well, you can turn off the location service, and then the apps that have access to it won't get anything. But you can't go into an app and deny it access to the location service, can you? Uh, you yes. can. Well, yes. You can? Can I do it on this phone here? Uh, Let me see this. But when you start using it, you have to. Let's go here. So if I have an app. That might be too old of a version. Like Al Jazeera English. Uh, I think it's, uh, here's permissions. I think it's version 7. Right. That I can, okay, so version 7 gives you the ability to line out and veto them. So I'm able to adjust this junk down here? Yeah. Okay, here I'm only allowed to learn about it. Okay, fair enough, thank you. I can, there are also third party apps you can install if you've rooted your phone. They give you the right to uh, line out and veto them. Good. Anyway, those things are um, permissions. There are many, many permissions, hundreds of them. Uh, with these strings defining them, and you can go look them up online and find out what they all are and decide which ones to assign your app. As you would imagine, a lot of sloppy developers just assign all the permissions to their app, or big inclusive ones, just like sloppy developers like to run everything as root and things like that. Um, anyway, so there's normal apps, normal low-risk permissions, and then there's dangerous ones that will require explicit permission for users and install time. 
Now you can uh, control your permissions by signatures, and this I guess is the reason apps are signed, because the signature seems to have nothing whatever to do with maintaining integrity of apps or preventing you from running malicious apps. It doesn't do any of that since you can be self-signed, but they use a signature to define the functionality uh, that your app's allowed to use, and you can define it as signature, so any apps with the same signature can access the same data directory, and then you could have a suite of related apps sharing data, or you can make signature or system, and then you're letting root in, in addition to uh, any, any applications installed on the system partition can get in, and any apps that share the same signature. Those are options if you want to have a family of related apps that share data. Yeah, you go, you got it on your phone? Neat. You can turn these on and off. You can select which app <coughs> permission to those. Great, things. thank you. And that's it's not quite as granular as I was thinking. No, but that's version seven? I believe so. Yeah, that's good. Okay, thank you. Good, so they built it in. All right, so you got to sign your app, but it can be a self-signed certificate, and uh, the only security mechanisms that use it are signature and signature or system. Now, the um, security measures that we've all gotten used to having in Windows since Vista and on are more or less present in modern versions of Android. And just like Windows Vista, Android 4.0 put in address-based layout randomization, but just like Vista, they didn't really do it right. It only applied to some features of apps and not everything that was randomized. That's, I think, still true in most modern versions of Windows. If we, in exploit development class, we're going through this. If you run um, Mona, a plug-in in Immunity, it will tell you which ones are actually randomized, and there are usually several things that are not randomized. Um, Anyway, uh, now more and more of it's randomized since 4.1, supposedly everything is randomized, whatever they call full ASLR. As I've learned from experience, when people say you have full ASLR, they mean mostly. And when they say they've signed an app, they mean mostly. There's sections of the app that aren't included in the signature, <laughs> and there's pieces of code that aren't really randomized. It's, uh, it's not that simple. Now, the non-execute bit, been around for a long time. Um, this makes it possible to define regions of memory that cannot execute. And these two are both intended to stop memory corruption attacks, primarily buffer overflow attacks. If you don't know where you are in memory, it's hard to jump to the code you injected. And if the data sections of memory are marked non-executable, you won't be able to run the code there anyway, even if you do manage to figure out where it is. The two of those together make it much more difficult to exploit memory corruption attacks, and there are ways around them, but they raise the bar quite a bit. So they're both present in any modern version of Android. <coughs> and a few more eye clickers. Which defense has been a present since 2.3? All right, and that's the non-executable bit. Hmm, all over the place. Which security measure is enforced by the user ID? All right, that's the kernel permissions. The kernel keeps one user account separate from the other user accounts. It's a fundamental part of Linux. All right, what are the permissions displayed to the user when you install the app? Those are the application framework permissions. Good, popular answer. All right, which one is called sandboxing? All right, and those are, again, the kernel permissions. That's what they mean by sandboxing. Each app has its own little area of storage to play with. All right, so there are components to apps. There are four basic components to every app. Activities, content providers, broadcast receivers, and services. And there are various ways to enter into the app, and each one of those, of course, increases the attack surface. The more ways you can feed data in or request service from the app, the more possibilities of having some kind of mistake. Intents are what's used for one process to communicate with another on Android. Um, so they send these messages, which I think of as like interrupts, although I don't think they're implemented by processor interrupts, but it's an intent that goes a message from one app to another. 
sort of like a network packet, but it's all happening inside the phone. And so activities are screens you can see. Every screen of the interface that presents you with something and you can now click on things, that's an activity. And in order to make it more convenient for developers, they're encouraged to reuse activities over and over. That means, of course, the more activities you have, the more attack service, the more opportunities there are for user to put in input. Content providers are things that can store data for you. So your app might want to save something like a password and send an intent to a content provider which will then store it somewhere, and the app doesn't even know where it's stored or how it was stored. That's not included necessarily. Typically it's a SQLite database, but it could be a flat file. And if the content provider is doing something stupid with it, the app won't know that. It could be doing something stupid like sticking it on the SD card or not encrypting it when it should be encrypted, and the app may well not know that. A broadcast receiver is one you, uh, you, you export for this purpose, and now it can receive intents from anywhere. And it can receive broadcast intents that are supposed to reach every app on the phone. Um, broadcast intents might be hostile. Indeed, any intent can be hostile. So any data that comes in from an intent should be scrubbed before you use it, because it might contain special characters and attempt to do things like a SQL injection or some other kind of attack. Services do the same thing that they do in Windows or the Mac, there are services in the background running, and these services will start when an intent starts them. So again, the services should realize that intents can be malicious. An intent is just a message that can contain some data and people can try to put in special characters or make it too long or otherwise send attacks. So you gotta store data someplace. You have flash memory, which is the main place you should be storing things. That's where you have a separate folder for each app and the other apps are not allowed in there. But you can also store it on the SD card if one exists or you can have emulated SD card, which has the same security properties, and the SD card is available to every app. So it's an unwise place to put anything that shouldn't be public. You can create any kind of file, but the API typically comes supporting SQLite databases and XML files, and that's typically what you will see if you look at the files stored locally. Uh, therefore, you can have SQL injection attacks based on SQLite. Near-field communication is a special radio in the, the phone which can connect to the near-field card readers, and those are RFID tags, um, like you might have in a smart card. And so your phone can emulate a card. So this came out with Gingerbread, and it's got this card emulation mode where your phone pretends to be an RFID card. And that is... There's even, a, in card emulation mode, data stored in a secure element goes straight out the RFID without passing through the processor. Now that is a pretty good idea. The secure element is the equivalent of the trusted platform module in a PC. It is a hardware coprocessor that can perform encryption and decryption, and it holds cryptographic keys, and they are not present in the memory space addressable by the processor at all. So no possible attack on the processor could steal those keys. Um, they also do not let anybody at those except Google and the carriers. They won't let any other apps read or write to the SE card, which is why if you're going to use your car, your phone for a credit card, which is more common and recommended these days, you should use the official apps like Apple Pay and Google Wallet, or whatever it is, or maybe Samsung Wallet if you got a Samsung phone, because any other payment app does not have access to the SE card and is intrinsically less safe. Anyway, all right, then you can have near, the near field communication can be used for peer to peer. I think they call this bump with iPhones or something. You can use Android Beam to just move data from one phone to the other through NFC by bringing them near each other. All right, if you want to ask another app to do something, what will you send? All right, that's intense. Good, all right. Which component adds records to a database? <coughs> all right, and those are the content providers. Good, all right. All right, which component is a screen of user interface? All right, and those are activities? Good, all right. Which feature 
is reserved for Google and carriers to use. All right, that's card emulation, where it emulates something like a credit card. And the data comes from a secure element. If an app stores data in its sandbox, what part of the phone is that data stored on? All right, that's in the flash. All right, good. Okay. If you want to develop things, the SDK is your main tool, now called Android Studio. Uh, it's a full Android development environment. It supposedly runs on every OS, although as we've seen in the projects, it runs pretty terribly on Windows. Um, it includes an emulator, which is not a virtual machine, but looks sort of like one. Uh, and you can test apps on that to see how they look, but it's a whole lot better to just get a real Android phone or a real virtual machine like VirtualBox or Jenny Motion. All right, so the Android, uh, it, the virtual device it makes can't receive phone calls or SMS messages, and uh, you can define a proxy to intercept traffic, and we've been doing that through Jenny Motion by just using the proxy settings. Android Debug Bridge is your primary tool. And the graphical features for debugging inside Android Studio just add a buggy, unreliable, pretty overlay on top of ADB, so I've learned to just ignore it and use ADB at the command line to get the right answer. So you connect to the device, either through USB cable or through a TCP port to reach a local device. Then you can push files to the device or pull them from the device, see the log cat. And by the way, I learned uh, earlier today how to get timestamps on LogCat. It's LogCat, there's a command, there's a switch in the command line to put a timestamp on each item. And you can install things and you can open a shell. It just gives you a shell on your device. If your device is not rooted, you'll get a non-root shell. If your device is rooted, you'll get a root shell while you were getting on Jenny Motion. So, all right. What do you need to manipulate web traffic? All right, you need a proxy, like burp, good. All right, what's the command line tool to control Android devices? That's ADB, Android Debug Bridge. Ah, good, everybody knows that. All right, so which command lets you type Linux commands into the Android device? All right, that's shell. Good, all right. Which one gets an APK file from the Android device? All right, and that is pull. All right, let me uh, show you a couple things about projects before we leave this. Um, so, there is, I written, wrote two new projects for this week, and they're good, clean fun. Um, let me point them out. Oh, I think I've already got them open someplace. Let's see. Yeah, all right. Uh, this one, not that one, but this one. Uh, this is Mass360. Uh, this is um, mobile device management. This is the equivalent of putting your phone in a domain, so the central server has control of it. So this IBM product, Mass360, I just did it again today, and the, they've changed the way everything looks, but the functionality is the same. So you go to their website and sign up for a free trial of this thing, and give it an email address and a password. They'll add you into it, and then um, you can start without iOS. This thing can control iOS and Android devices, in principle. The only part I put in this project is iOS. So then you get a chance to send a request to an email address and add a device. Then you open that email on the phone. Now it tells you here, the person on the phone is gonna need this corporate identifier and passcode to log in so that if somehow you're sending invitations and the emails go astray, 
or your employees might have more than one phone and they open the email on the wrong phone. Anyway, I don't know what you're thinking about. There's a passcode required. So um, go on your phone, open your email in a browser. I use mailinator.com, which is a free email service where you don't have to make accounts or anything which is good for projects like this, although certainly not anonymous enough for most purposes, and you'll find a device enrollment request. So when you open the device enrollment request, it'll have a URL for you to click and a username and passcode, and the URL will open the app in the Play Store. So you install this app, and this app places your control, your device under remote control of your boss. So it is something they would require you to do, then you have to put in your corporate identifier and your email, and activate this thing, and then you get a Mass360 homepage. They can send documents to you, like policies and things they want you to do, and you can look at your settings, which we'll look at later. So now, um, on your PC, or whatever your computer is, you can observe that now you have a phone in your company. You can get an inventory of phones, it'll show them, you got one here, um, that's now installed the app and joined your company network, and now you can control it. So. You have many things you can control here. If you look at uh, security policies, you get a chance to add policies by default. It has a default Android and iOS and Windows phone policy, as if anybody had a Windows phone. Anyway, uh, the only thing we care about here is Android, and you can add a new policy. So I say uh, add a policy called alpha passcode to force them to have an alphanumeric passcode. And then you can configure that policy and say they have to have an eight character alphanumeric passcode, which is a whole lot better than a four digit PIN. And when you put that out there, you can have a description of it and then um, publish the policy to all your phones. So now all your Android phones have a policy that says they should have that. You also specified the punishment up here, um, 10 password attempts for wipe, and you can set time here, like for the idle time before it will lock and so on. You know, you control whatever you want. And so now, when you're done, it'll say policy is published successfully. You can set it as the default policy, so all Android phones have to have it. And now you can go check compliance on your phone. You look at the compliance status of your phone, and it will lie to you and say everything is fine, because just like a domain controller, it doesn't pull the central thing very frequently. In fact, it says it can take up to 90 minutes to pull the central thing. The, uh, the central point of administration, which the same thing's true of domains. I think it can take a half hour or more for policies to percolate to the end of the domain. So if you want to force it, you hit this refresh button here, and within a few minutes it'll tell you your device is out of compliance. Now, your boss can determine the punishment for this, up to like wiping all the data, locking you out of your phone, or just, you know, alerting them that they should like yell at you. Uh, this one didn't have a ruthless punishment, but it's going to warn you, you have to change your device passcode, go to 8-digit alphanumeric. And you can detect if the phone is jailbroken and all sorts of other things. Of course, um, in principle, someone could jailbreak their phone and then hack the compliance app to lie and say they're in compliance. But um, that, I think, is true of almost everything. This reminds me a lot of the um, applications that make sure that you have antivirus running on all your devices. Um, Again, that was a problem. I know one thing, um, the colleges switched to that. We considered it here. And some colleges switched to this thing where it has to say that you have the official antivirus running and all the Windows patches on. And then, if you're using Linux, you can't possibly. So there's a special hack tool that will lie to the uh, central server and tell it that your Windows box with the right stuff on it. <laughs> so you know these things are, uh, are not enormously powerful tools, but they will have some tendency to mean you're under control of things. And that's true of all security measures. You know, the real hackers are out of your control. You're only going to be able to control the people up to a certain skill level. And after that, they're going to be able to lie to you. Anyway, that's the game. Now, if you want to um, remove this device, you try to uninstall it, this app, you'll find out that the uninstall button is grayed out. Of course, you are not authorized to uninstall this app once you have installed it, because you place control of your device at the company. The company has to unenroll you at the server. And after it, you have been unenrolled, remove control, then you will discover that it's possible for you to uninstall the app. And that's the game there. Anyway, this is a good thing to know. I think this is very practical. Many people have this problem. Um, I just mentioned in passing, unless you, the people that have Macs and PCs in their company, which is pretty much everybody, have discovered that it's very hard to get Macs to join Windows domains and really submit to their control. As far as I know, all the companies I'm aware of have two central points of administration now. They have a domain controller for Windows and they have Casper for the Mac. 
and now they have to run both of these servers. If anybody knows a better solution, let me know. Um, it reminds me of the old days when you'd have two servers, a Windows server and a uh, NetWare server. Anyway, the other thing I thought was good was Keylogger. I spent the last day and a half doing this. So I told Citibank in 2015 that their app was vulnerable to modification, and they didn't care, like most of these guys, and didn't do anything about it. So I tried to do it again, and um, what I found was the original Citibank app will no longer install on my old device, but the Chinese version will. So I installed that and tried to hack it, and I couldn't hack it. So it motivated me to try some more advanced techniques, and that's why I wanted to put this in here. It's extra credit, but it certainly shows you a couple more techniques if you really want to Trojan apps. I spent a whole day trying to query and find where the password was stored on this thing. So you got a Citibank app, and it has a login screen, and you can unpack the APK file like always, and you can, now even you view the Smalley file, you'll see just the usual kind of Smalley code. Now the beginning of every file of Smalley, this one here is, um, a.1.smalley because they're using ProGuard. So a lot of the um, names of files have been turned into just letters. Not enough of them at all, but still that's what ProGuard does. So the A.1 has some variables defined up top and then it has a method called the constructor. The constructor is very handy for Trojaning because every time you call any file, the first thing it has to do is run the constructor. So if you just put a log entry in the constructor of a file, like if you search for encryption, you'll find like four different libraries doing encryption, of which only one is really used. So just Trojan the constructor in each one, and you'll find out which one's actually used. Anyway, so what I did was, I hunted around with the technique we've used in the past, where you look for a word like password or login or username, and I couldn't find anything useful. <laughs> then I did what I'd done before. I took um, a burp, put it in the middle, installed the burp certificate so it did not have an HTTPS error, and then watched the request go through and tried to find the re login request and look for those parameters, and none of them, I couldn't find any of them by name either. So I was getting nowhere, so I finally said, well, let's go all the way. This is the most powerful tool I've, come I've had to do this. I wrote this a while ago. This is, that's all there is to it. That much Python is what it takes to Trojan every method in the app because it's very simple. Let me just point out, and after you run that, here's what it does to that one file. All you have to do, every method starts with a dot locals. This tells you how many local variables there are. There can be a number from 0 through 15. If there's any, even one or anything higher here, then you can put this Trojan in because you can use the v0 variable before it's used again, and it will not break the app. I discovered this through trial and error. So if this locals is one or higher, you can just add these lines without changing anything else in the app and it will work. It will put an entry in the log. And what I put in this log is just the name of the file we're in and what line number we're on. And if it's a locals zero, you change it to locals one. That's all that Python code does. You can do it in a text editor with search and replace, except you have to do it for many files. So all this does is it finds any place there is locals zero and changes it to locals one. And then, after every line that says locals anything, it puts in this Trojan stuff, Trojan constant string, that's it. It's, but the result is now when you run the app, it will just go screaming across. I think I still have the city ad cap in here. Let me see if I can show you this. Um, library, Android, SDK, platform tools. All right, so there's the Android log. Okay, and I just found out how to do this on iOS too, so we'll have those projects coming up, but not here yet. So now, yeah, yeah, if I go here, let's see if I still have Citibank. Whoops, that's not how you do it. Do it this way. Come on. Citibank, good. Okay, here's Chinese Citibank. Now this thing is kind of slow to run now, but it puts a log entry for every single method that goes by. Now, what I did here um, is I then leave this running and I notice this. If I press a letter, so my log entries go by. I press it again, some log entries go by. Every single letter causes certain things to appear there. And that's all I needed. So I was able to find the key press to make a key logger. Instead of finding where it stored this variable, I just found the, the part that reads it. And what happens after you Trojan everything is Every single key press produces these three log entries. Uh, Smalley, Org, Apache, Cordova, Engine, System, Web, View, Smalley, 
Cordova WebView Imp Engine Client Smalley and Cordova WebView Imp 1 Smalley. There's only three places I have to hunt now to see which one of them I can figure out how to Trojan. So that was very productive. Um, the other, what I've been trying to do for about half a day was to press login and record the network traffic and hit the log and record the time and try to find which methods were called near the time when the actual transmission went out over the network. And that was driving me nuts. They're doing something not obvious. But this one turned out to do it because there's a thing called on dispatch key event. And then it has something called get key code. So when you press the key, that creates a key event. And this gets the key code. And I've been here before. Um, in 2015, there is a Android key code, which is like an ASCII code, but it is actually geometrical on the keyboard, telling you which key you pressed. But the point is, it's, it maps one by one to letters. So the only thing that's irritating is the only thing I know how to put in the log is a string. As far as I know, that's the only thing you can put in a log. So if you have any other kind of data, you have to convert it into a string. And there's quite a few t pieces of data I don't know how to convert it to a string in Smalley. But I managed to figure this one out. A key code can be, con so V2 has a key code. That's how you read this thing. This is, by the way, a common uh, Smalley thing. You invoke an app. This is the input data for parameter one. And this will take the key event and turn it into a key code, which is an integer. It will not put it anywhere. It will just do the, the process. You then have to move the result into something. So V2 will now contain the key code version of P1, which apparently was the key event, a data structure of some kind. Then you have to invoke this to take integer and turn it into the value of the integer. I don't understand why you have to do that, but you do. Apparently, it is some more complicated structure called an integer, which is something like a pointer to an integer or something. Then you have to get the value of it. Then you have to take the value and turn it into a string. And now you can record it. And if you make any typos anywhere here, it will just kill the app. It will just crash. So that's why if you want to start figuring out how, how to do the steps, the number one most important rule is to move in very small steps. Add just a couple of lines and recompile and run, because you will very often break the app and have to take out whatever change you just made. But anyway, managed to get this working. So now um, that's what I got here. And if I just run the log and and filter for the Trojan, grep Trojan. Then let me put some in blank lines in here. Now if I go here and I type in stuff like A, B, C, D, you see how it works? It makes two entries for every letter I press. 29 is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. A capital A, Shift A, is two key presses, Shift and A. It really is mapping to the keyboard. So 59 is shift, and that's A. And, uh, but you can reconstruct passwords from that data or anything else. So it's a useful thing to know. And uh, there will come a time when people care, but banks don't care yet. All right. And I think those are the only two new projects I wanted to talk about. I think that's it. Any other questions about anything? All right, good, I'll clean up, which will take a little while, and then I'll go to the lab.